Coming up on Smart Tech Today, Matthew Casanelli is out, but don't worry, we've got Rosemary Orchard here to give us a tour of her smart home. There's so much to check out. Lots of automations, lots of cool products, lots of suggestions. Plus, we cover the news of the week and share our picks as usual. Stay tuned. This is an episode you don't want to miss. Podcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. This episode of Smart Tech Today is brought to you by Udacity. Gain in-demand tech skills in as little as three months with Udacity's part-time online tech courses. Visit udacity.com slash twit and get 75% off any program with code twit75. Limited time offer. Welcome to Smart Tech Today, where we explain the exciting, dynamic, and sometimes confusing subject that is the Internet of Things. I am one of your hosts, Micah Sargent. And this week, I'm not Matthew Casanelli. I'm Rosemary Orchard. No, this isn't iOS Today. This is Smart Tech Today. It is. And in fact, uh, while I am working from home today uh, and will be doing that for a while for Smart Tech Today and for Tech News Weekly, which some of you may have seen earlier in the day, tomorrow you will see me back in the studio because on Fridays I am the host in the studio. So uh, those will still be coming to you from the old, new, old, new look and feel, uh, whereas this is uh, the new, old, new, old look and feel uh, that uh, you can expect. Although it's new, again, because Rosemary's here instead of Matthew, at which point it will transition to being old, new, old again My brain. next week. <laughs> <laughs> Have we confused uh, everybody who's watching the live stream? That's yeah, the goal. Yeah, everybody is officially confused. I love it. Yeah. Um, we've got a few stories this morning. Well, we would have a few stories if I didn't immediately click closed my spreadsheet that has all of them in it. Um, we've got a few <laughs> well, stories. Well, I've got this mine week. right here. Excellent. I Before got you. the. The big part of the show today is uh, going to be talking to Rosemary about her smart home setup because Rosemary's got all sorts of automations running, all sorts of gadgets, and somehow she's gotten them all to actually do what they're meant to do. And so I am super interested in hearing more about her smart home setup and her automations, what stuff runs automatically, what doesn't. Uh, but we will do a few news pieces before we get into that and, of course, round things out with our picks of the week. Uh, the first piece here is one from TechCrunch, and it's talking about how uh, a provision for drunk driving might actually result in uh, more driver monitoring technology. So I find this interesting because, so the, get this part from TechCrunch, um, companies developing driver detection technology could get a boost from a provision that's tucked inside the 2,702 page $1 trillion infrastructure bill that would require automakers to build into new cars a technology that can tell if drivers have had a few cold ones. So the provision is called the Reduce Impaired Driving for Everyone Act. That's R-I-D-E-A. Uh, and because everybody loves to have a, um, a nice acronym there. Um, so it's RIDE Act. Uh, and this is, uh, it was introduced in April of 2021. And essentially what it says is, hey, vehicles are going to need to be able to uh, determine if the driver is impaired. And so how do car makers meet that demand? Because uh, there was a, a demand for uh, backup cameras in vehicles mm -hmm. uh, that cars have had to meet since, I think, was it two years ago? Uh, any new car had to meet that demand. And then now this one... Um, could mean that uh, these different car makers will either be scrambling to find companies that do this and know how to do this, or it could mean that they themselves will have to uh, strike up uh, an, a built-in kind of uh, team to make this happen. And maybe some of them been, have been working on it already. But uh, I found this interesting on its own, uh, especially as we look to the self-driving future and the autonomous driving future, uh, how this could play a role in making sure that uh, we are being more aware of impaired driving on the road. And yeah, I, I'm, I'm curious your thoughts, Rosemary, on this. I know this is a U.S. you know decision, but mm -hmm. uh, 
certainly when comparing it to uh, the the option of, of going completely driverless, um, this might be a good first step for reducing drunk driving. Yeah, I think this is really interesting. So over here in the UK, and I'm, I'm pretty sure you've got a similar thing. Um, we have uh, some insurance levels which require you to put a black box in your car. Basically, it's something you just plug into the charging port in your car um, and it transmits your driving data back to the insurance company and they determine with that whether or not you're a good driver. And this is one way that you can reduce your insurance premiums. So this is often targeted at people who've just got their license who, you know, could be considered to be young and irresponsible. Uh, the the drinking age here is 18, not 21. You pass your, your driver's test at 17. So you've got a year of driving before you can start drinking in theory. Um, so, you know, they, they have this to help people reduce their insurance premiums, but it transmits driving data automatically. Um, and so I'm guessing that this is going to be sort of used um, in, a, in a similar way. And I mean, I know that there are a lot of companies out there who produce cars purely for the American market. Um, and there are some models of cars which are only available in the US. Um, but equally, all of those car manufacturers who currently produce something and can sell it in Germany and just ship it over to the US and just change the language on it to English and done, um, are they going to want to build in a specific tech behind the, sc behind the scenes or are they going to want something where, uh, you know, it, they it, it's something that they can install in the dealership, um, essentially, uh, if it's required. I didn't realize that backup cameras were required in US cars. Um, over here, they're certainly optional. I love mine. I recently got a new car. Um, but yeah, it, it's interesting. I know my car has certain safety features built in. So for example, uh, lane detection and lane changing, if I try and change lane without indicating, it will vibrate my steering wheel pretty hard and pull me back into the lane. Um, and this is used to you know avoid drifting um, when people are on lane long journeys and get bored and they stop paying attention to the road. Um, but uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's certainly interesting to, to see them doing this. Uh, I, I wonder if there's a different way to solve the problem, but I'm guessing they've already looked at that and decided maybe that's too costly. Let's make the technology do it. Technology is infallible. <laughs> uh, and yeah, just to clarify, it was in May 2018 when the federal law uh, came into place that all in the United States that all new passenger cars, trucks, vans, and other vehicles weighing less than 10,000 pounds have to be equipped with rear view monitoring technology. Uh, so that has been the case since 2018. Of course, vehicles that already exist that are older than that don't have to have it and they don't need to be installed. It's on the part of the, it's on the, uh, the it's the responsibility of the manufacturer of vehicles to make that uh, happen with all new vehicles. Um, this next one, speaking of uh, autonomous vehicles, uh, I thought was interesting. It's a company called Argo AI, and uh, Argo AI applied for a permit in California and has been granted that permit to allow the company to give people free rides in its self-driving vehicles on the state's public roads. The California Public Utilities Commission, this is according to TechCrunch, issued the so-called Drivered AV Pilot Permit earlier this month. Um, and it says a little more than a week after Argo and Ford announced plans to launch at least 1,000 self-driving vehicles on Lyft's ride-hailing network in a number of cities over the next five years, uh, this permit came through. So Argo is um, part of it's backed by Ford and Volkswagen. Uh, so it's not just, you know, some small company all on its own. It's got some big tech backers. Uh, but I found this really interesting that they are, they've been given the permission to be able to uh, let people ride in their driverless vehicles. Yeah, yeah, this is very interesting. On the one hand, I would absolutely love to come and have a ride in one of these things. On the other hand, you could guarantee that, you know, because I'm super interested in this kind of thing, it would be the one time that it, you know, has uh -huh. a, a software breakdown and, and everything just sort of crashes and it pulls over to the side of the road and says, I'm sorry, I cannot continue. <laughs> Get <journey."> out. <laughs> or whatever it is. I, I, would I have called when, you when an it, Uber. If it crashes, um, that it is that is purely a software crash, not a Oh my God! Crash, yeah, because that would be terrifying. Um, oh, that never, gives yeah, whole new meaning. 
Yeah. Whole new meaning to the term crash. Wow. Yeah, yeah. Imagine, you know, in three years you say my lift crashed and somebody goes, oh man, did it be sought again? And you're like, no, 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 it actually hit another vehicle. And you have to explain that to people. Um, uh, I mean, on the other hand, if, if if the world goes to the only, like the vast majority of car crashes are purely software and it randomly reboots. Yeah, I could probably That's live with true. that. You prefer um, that to yeah, the other kind. Yeah, it's, it's interesting that they've got permits and so on. It's, it seems to me like this is a limited area um, and that they have, um, you know, a limited, you know, a li limited number that they're allowed to do, um, which is really cool. Um, and I would love to see more of this, ideally outside of California. Um, you know, there are other places in the world where uh, it would be fun to, to run this. I know uh, Bath is sitting near me here in the UK. Um, they have um, a low emissions zone. This is the sort of thing that would be ideal there for, you know, the time for the people who aren't able to get the bus or times where buses just simply aren't appropriate. Um, and uh, they're trialing e-scooters and so on. So why not this? It would be great if uh, they can spread out and test this in more places around the world. Agreed. All right, up next, um, we talked a little bit about this last week, and I remember seeing some people kind of complaining that uh, businesses don't have their COVID policies listed online. So you go to a place and you don't know what it's going to be, uh, what you need to follow, what you don't need to follow, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and so you may be happy to hear that Yelp has added some tools that will let businesses share their COVID policies. And of course, uh, how that relates to vaccines and masks and things like that. So um, I love this because I was curious about this myself. Um, over the past, well, maybe it was, I can't remember when, but some, I think it was last week, but it might've been the week before. Anyway, my partner and I went to um, an, a restaurant with outdoor seating uh, after we had spent the uh, day in Santa Cruz. And I was kind of wondering what the policy was going to be, what, you know, what they had in place, what they needed to see from us in order to uh partake, et cetera, et cetera. And I think we both were kind of like, it'd be really nice to know what that means. And so it says that um, Yelp is going to be rolling out two profile attribu attributes, including proof of vaccination required, uh, staff fully vaccinated, which is cool. And then you will also have information about, um, let's see, it says uh, masks and, mm -hmm. uh, and, you know, some of the, the things like where you can sit and if there's outdoor dining. So this seems really cool. And then it also means that those of us who are taking this thing seriously can sort and filter the different places by, yes, the staff has to be vaccinated in order to, to be working. So I know that I, if I'm going to that place, that the staff is vaccinated or that uh, in order to get in, you have to show proof of vaccination. Okay, now I suddenly can go to that place and feel comf more comfortable uh, by going there. So I think this is something that a lot of people have wanted for a while, and I'm glad to see Yelp, which is used by a lot of businesses, be it passively or actively, uh, taking advantage of this because I think that it encourages them to hop on. Yeah, yeah. I really hope that this rolls out in more places. Uh, it says that it's rolling out on Thursday. I'm aware it's still early Thursday in the US, but over here in the UK, it's pretty late on Thursday. Uh, and it's definitely not in some of the local businesses that I know do use Yelp and they update their menus and so on regularly. Um, so I, I'm, I'm hoping to see this here. Um, you know, we've recently... Um, changed uh, our mask policy so masks uh, don't, uh, you know, that you don't need to wear a mask. But at the same time, I'm still just wearing mine everywhere. Uh, I've only recently had my second vaccine, so it's not fully kicked in yet. So I'm hoping that, uh, you know, this will help keep some people safe until I can be safer, at which point I'll probably still keep wearing it anyway. I, I <laughs> want to see this in more places. Um, it, it would be great. We, we already have um, the ability to scan and sign in and say we were here so that they can uh, do tracking um, you know, through through a system, this is just a step to to help those people who care. Um, you know, keep themselves and their friends and family safe. Um, I, I see this as a wonderful thing. Um, and if you don't want this information, that's fine. You you can scroll past it. Um, you know, mm -hmm. but I th I think having this information is is great. Um, and I suspect that we won't see companies use this if they 
want to say staff not vaccinated. We don't care about vaccinations. We're not going to see companies advertising that. Right. Because you can filter um, for, hey, we want, I want somewhere where staff are fully vaccinated, you know, assuming that it's possible for those staff to be fully vaccinated um, or, and or proof of vaccinations required. Those businesses are automatically going to be rewarded for doing the right thing. So uh, yeah, it's going to be good if this rolls out everywhere. Agreed. Uh, up next, the Amazon Halo Band. Uh, up to this point, it's been a pretty kind of locked in product, a product that you could use with Amazon's own fitness service and have that tracking take place. But unlike many of the other wearables in the market that had integrations with other things, Amazon's band was just kind of uh, you use it with with the Halo service and you stop there. Now, uh, the band can share your heart rate to other apps and workout equipment. Uh, so you're getting a little bit more of that information pulled out of that more walled garden and uh, open to other things. So The Verge says it's updating the band with the ability to share live heart rate information with third-party devices and fitness apps over Bluetooth low energy. Uh, it's currently partnered with Nordic Track for its iFit service along with OpenFit and Climber. That means that when you do activities in those apps, for example, uh, it will be able to keep track of your live heart rate. This is a little bit like what Apple Fitness offers with the Apple Watch, where it will show you on screen your heart rate live as you are completing these exercises uh, and then also giving you information about calories that you've burned. So the Halo Band falls more in line with the fitness features that the Apple Watch has. And as far as that goes, I think that's fantastic. Yeah, yeah, this is really interesting. I'm going to be obviously a lot more interested when I'm actually able to get my hands on one of these things. Uh, they're only available in the US at the moment in 50 states. So, you know, I, I can't get my hands on it. Um, but at the same time, I'm also currently not yet going to a gym again. Um, so I, I don't really have any devices like that I could connect this to. Um, uh, but, you know, it, it'll be good when that comes out. And I think honestly, with, with health and fitness, the more integration options something has, the better it is for you because it's not going to force you into doing things one particular way. It will allow you to do things in whatever way is best for you and your body. Um, and obviously, you know, when it comes to your health, you've got to do what works for your body. Agreed. Uh, and then in the fitness world, for those of you with Peloton treadmills, you may be happy to hear that soon you won't need that $40 a month subscription in order to use your treadmill. Uh, if you're wondering what the heck that's all about, we talked a little bit about it on this show back whenever it happened, but uh, the Peloton treadmill was part of a recall, a safety recall, because it was injuring and in one case uh, actually killing, um, or should I say resulting in the death of uh, a, a human being. And so they were working on getting that fixed. And one of the ways that they uh, worked on getting it fixed is offering the ability to type in a PIN uh, or a passcode in order to activate the treadmill so that the treadmill would not be started automatically without an adult present or what have you. Um, but the only way that you could use that passcode is if you subscribed to Peloton's all access membership. That was the only thing to kind of make the treadmill safe other than just getting it out of your house, sending it back. So what they did was uh, they said, okay, well, you pay this $40 per month subscription with three months of the subscription for free. And now you've got the pin or the passcode that you need to make this happen. Obviously people were saying, so what you're telling us is we have to pay more money than we just did for the Peloton uh, treadmill in order for it to be safe to use in our homes. And Peloton said, yeah, at the time. Now that is changing. Uh, you, according to uh, Peloton's support page, the tread lock feature that locks the treadmill if you're not in a class and haven't used the treadmill in 45 seconds uh, will be available for use without uh, that subscription needed. So the update... Um, is let's see I'm trying to see where it says that uh peloton released a software update yeah 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 okay so yeah anyway now that won't be the case uh all tread owners can now access treadlock along with the just run feature this is as of wednesday so uh yesterday as we're recording this show 
This, again, is one of those situations where you go, well, not all smart technology, internet-connected technology is, uh, is playing the right game. <laughs> and nope. it's where I hesitate to uh, partake in devices whose functionality is less based on the hardware part of the device and more based on the uh, service that comes with it. And uh, it makes me hesitant to you know, want to get something like that. Maybe I'll go for the yeah. dumb TV instead of the smart TV or the, uh, the dumb treadmill instead of the smart treadmill. Yeah. I mean, you're paying what, two and a half to four and a half thousand dollars for this yeah. device. Whew. You really shouldn't have to pay $40 a month in order to set a pin on it. Also, Whose idea was it to use a pin for the security? Because I'm sorry, every kid out there whose parents have put a pin code on the TV channels they don't want their kid watching unless they unlock it has figured <laughs> out that it's mom's birthday or that it's the <laughs> wedding anniversary or something like that. Their kids aren't stupid. They know what a pin is and how to type it in. How do you think they're in your iPhone all the time? Um, you know, they, they figure this stuff out very quickly. The only thing potentially preventing small children from typing in the pin is the fact that that's a 32 inch freaking HD touchscreen on the Tread Plus, and that might be a bit <laughs> above their head. But you know what? A kid's going to go find a stylus or something and poke it if they really want to play with this thing. Um, so, you know, I, I mean, personally, I think if you've got one of these in your home uh, the, and you are worried about, you know, kids turning it on and playing with it, the, the best thing to do when you're not using it is just unplug the darn thing. Then it can't mm -hmm. talk to the internet anyway um, if, if you don't want it to. Um, yeah, I've recently been looking at potentially getting some kind of a treadmill, one of those flat ones without the handles I can put on, under my desk uh, just mm -hmm. for walking speeds, not running speeds. Uh, but yeah, one of my requirements was not internet connected, please. Uh, I don't really need that. I would love it if it connected to my Apple Watch or something. Um, but you know what? I'm good if it doesn't. I can I can set a workout on my Apple Watch manually. Exactly. If if the trade off is that I'm not going to be suddenly hit with surprise, you can't use this, then I'm okay with going uh, completely yeah. uh, disconnected from the internet for sure. All right, yeah. we've got some more news to talk about, but I do want to take a quick break so I can tell you about Udacity, who are sponsoring this week's episode of Smart Tech Today. Udacity offers a unique part-time online education program that's geared for those who are looking to take their tech knowledge to the next level with specialized and exciting content. Udacity offers the latest cutting-edge nanodegree programs, many of which are not available anywhere else. You get AI, deep learning, this next one's going to shock you. Flying car and autonomous flight engineer. Yes, that's there. Intro to self-driving cars, machine learning engineer, and robotics software engineer. To create the course content, Udacity partners with industry leaders such as Microsoft, Google, IBM, AWS, and more, and selects team leads at top companies to be the instructors. If you love learning and are always looking to know more new tech stuff, well, Udacity is for you. Udacity can help you master the latest tech skills and techniques. Courses are project-based with active learning that covers cutting-edge technology and lets you test your knowledge. Homework and projects, get this, they are reviewed by actual, real, qualified professionals. So you're going to have real human feedback and reviews, and you will have access to mentors 24-7. Udacity's flexible schedules means you can put in just five to 10 hours a week working at your own pace any time of the day or night and graduate in as little as three months. The World Economic Forum estimates that 75 million jobs will be replaced by automated processes within the next three years. Udacity prepares its students for the jobs of the future. More than 14 million people in over 240 countries now use Udacity. You can check out their detailed course listings at udacity.com. It's fun to go there and just see what is available because there's a lot there. Once you enroll as a student in a specific course offering, you'll be prompted to view the online course as well as complete a series of projects and support courses. They offer flexible payment options and you can learn at your own pace and on your own schedule. Udacity also has free courses if you want to give it a try and see if it's for you. Oh, by the way, does your team need to master cutting edge technologies like data science, AI, and cybersecurity? Well, 
you might want to know about Udacity for Enterprise so you can upskill your entire workforce with real world project based learning. Be sure to check out the Enterprise section of Udacity's website today. Get the in demand tech skills you need to advance your career. Visit udacity.com slash twit and get 75% off any program with code twit75. A limited time offer. That's udacity.com slash twit and enter twit75. Thanks so much to Udacity for sponsoring this week's episode of Smart Tech Today. All right. Uh, in a very googly thing, as Google is wont to do, it has leaked uh, some new hardware. And no, I'm not talking about the new pixels. I'm talking about the new Nest devices. Uh, so these are unannounced Nest security cameras, and uh, they will be coming out um, at some point. But uh, it's these are the, the different things that The Verge has the piece. As far as we can tell, the new devices include a combined outdoor-indoor battery-powered Nest Cam, a Nest Cam mm -hmm. that includes a floodlight, an indoor wired Nest Cam, and a battery-powered Nest doorbell. Uh, these were not available, of course, for purchase, but it is uh, nice to know that uh, Google is working on uh, some new stuff, especially these battery-powered ones. So it, it seems to me that uh, the pattern shows you uh, the pattern of, of kind of uh, smart home manufacturers typically is uh, they create a wireless doorbell camera that is... Um, needs the connection of the kind of uh, old school, the power of the old school doorbell that you may have had. And then shortly after that, the company comes out with one that is uh, battery powered. And then you end up just, you know, charging it once a week or once every couple of weeks or, or however long it needs mm -hmm. to be. So I'm not surprised to see these battery powered options. Uh, they tend to be far more convenient and they are better for renters uh, in particular yeah. who aren't able necessarily to install more permanent hardwired options. Yeah, yeah. They're also great for people um, over here uh, who live in uh, an apartment who, even though I own my apartment, uh, because, you know, we have restrictions on what we can do to the building, I can't just drill through the wall and make a hole <laughs> and run some electricity out there and put a wired doorbell out there. That's not okay. Um, and I, I actually looked at a variety of different cameras and I ended up with the now discontinued ring peephole camera because that required me to do nothing more than unscrew this, the peephole that was already there and put the ring doorbell there instead. And that was it. And now I trash that once every couple of months. Um, my parents wanted a new doorbell um, and uh, I got them a Eufy actually instead of the ring because I knew they were going to complain about paying a subscription every month um, to, to see things and the Eufy comes with the, the base station or the plug-in chime, depending on which model you get. But it's great to see that Google are doing this as well. Um, I, I, I'm fully of the opinion that we need way more competitors in this area. Um, I mean, obviously, I'd love it if it had HomeKit support, being an Apple person myself. Um, but, you know, I, I don't think Google's going to come up with HomeKit support, but maybe some enterprising people will figure out something for HomeBridge or Home Assistant that lets me get it in there. Um, but this is great. I have actually pre-ordered a new uh, UV camera with a spotlight functionality on um, because I, I have a storage cupboard, which occasionally maintenance people need access to to control the electricity in the shared spaces. Um, and I'd love to just, you know, check whether or not they've actually been, um, which right now I can't easily do. Um, and uh, having the camera there would just give me a little peace of mind inside of my storage cupboard. So, you know, it's only if they're going into my space. Um, but yeah, this is great. I also love um, what I can see here on one of these um, uh, pictures. There was a, a picture of somebody putting a camera onto a magnetic mount. So, you you know, the mount stays there and then the camera just magnetizes up. Um, that was on 9 to 5 Google by the looks of it. Um, and uh, I really like that. Um, there's actually a link in, in the uh, uh, the Smart Tech Today Discord. Um, uh, apparently the battery um, flagship one with a floodlight is going to be 179. And I think it has uh, just been unveiled um, or very recently it was officially unveiled today. Uh, but I really like this. It looks really good. And I, I like in particular the fact that there's indoor outdoor cameras. Uh, most other companies seem to do outdoor or indoor and you can use indoor outdoor and outdoor indoor, but th they never explicitly say this is an indoor outdoor camera. 
Um, so it's good that there are more options coming. Yeah, I agree. Um, all right. This next piece is about how... Uh, so I, I just saw as a person who's uh, very closely watches kind of Apple news um, that Apple has expanded its own support for digital cards across the... Uh, well, in the United States and in Canada. And with that has come uh, the option for contactless student IDs. Um, but... What this Verge article is uh, kind of covering is that this is uh, bigger than just Apple. It's uh, kind of campuses across the U.S. and Canada are uh, adopting virtual student IDs. I think this is a really good idea because it's cleaner. It reduces cost. It reduces uh, the time it takes to get a replacement if you need to get a replacement or if your name changes or if you're, uh, you know, you, you are unenrolled and re-enroll in something else and you need to have a new number. Any number of things where that physical ID that I still have clinking around somewhere from when I was in college uh, has you know, disappeared and you need to get a new one. I think this is great. And I also like that this is like using universities as the jumping off point to then start adding more employer options and more hotel options. All of that is uh, pretty exciting for the future of digital wallet versions of these cards that were kind of uh, required to carry around with us everywhere in order to access different services. Yeah, I really love this. Uh, I know around the world, universities have a variety of different solutions for um, updating student IDs and making sure that people don't have student IDs for too long. I know when I went to university here in the UK, my degree program was four years. I took it an extra year in the middle. Um, and so they had to issue me with a new ID card. Um, and then I, I studied uh, in Austria and instead they have a thermal sort of strip on the back, which every semester after you paid your, your semester fee, you go, you stick the card in a machine at the university, it erases what's on the back and it prints the new date. So every single semester, you just take the card, you stick it in and it prints, prints out the new date and it's updated, ready to go. So it really is only name changes or significant changes in physical appearance um, where they would have to print a whole new card. So that, of course, reduces waste. Um, but I, I, I love the fact that, you know, digital as well, because let's face it, uh, a lot of uh, students use their student ID for a whole bunch of things, discounts everywhere and so on. Uh, the physical card is one of the first things that gets lost and a lot of people end up replacing it at some point, usually fairly early on in their first semester before they get used to this thing must be super glued to my hand and I use it all the time. <laughs> um, and so people end up replacing them. And so I'm, I'm really glad to see this is going digital because let's face it, many people are not going to forget their phone. I'm, I would say nobody. I'm sure somebody will. Um, but uh, there are very few people who will forget their phone for a significant amount of time at any rate. Um, so... Yeah, this, this is great. Uh, I, I hope this expands around the world. Uh, that would be wonderful if it did. Agreed. Um, up next, I wanted to mention that the AirPods Pro, this is a beta uh, update to the firmware, um, but it is uh, an update that's going to provide a feature called Conversation Boost. And this is a feature for folks with low or no hearing, well, low hearing in particular, um, in order to give them the ability to kind of bring up the the volume of a conversation. So they could be wearing AirPods, they enable this feature, and it makes it easier to hear the conversation that they're having. Uh, so it specifically adjusts the EQ. And honestly, when I think about, uh, Matthew and I started calling them hearables. When I think about hearables, this is one of those features that I think uh, speaks to a future where many of us are regularly wearing hearables and using them to change how we interact with the world. So it can help us drown out sounds that we don't want to hear. It can help us bring up sounds that we do want to hear. And it can adapt to our environment to provide better options in certain places and uh, make adjustments in other places. Apple already has technology for warning you when uh, sound 
that's around you is particularly damaging to your ears. Uh, there's a feature now that will actually sort of drop loud sounds. So if, if you've ever had that situation, I've done this before with in-ear monitors, and it is the absolute worst thing. You plug in in-ear monitors, which are very close to your eardrums, and then you end up playing something and you f didn't have the volume turned down and it just blasts your eardrums. It's so painful and terrible for your hearing. And so Apple has this feature that will essentially bring that down automatically so that you don't do that. All of these things come together when they can come together. And suddenly you kind of imagine hearables that you wear relatively consistently that do all of that for you. They keep your ears from being damaged by sounds. They help you better understand uh, the folks that are around you. They drown out those sounds that are uh, keeping you from hearing things, all of that. So um, I... And uh, one more point that I'll make is that uh, Renee Ritchie of uh, MacBreak Weekly has pointed out that um, that a lot of times these features come to come from the accessibility team and they bleed out into the rest of the, uh, the the software and into the rest of the ecosystem. And so I wouldn't be surprised if in the future Conversation Boost becomes a feature that's uh, not just accessibility minded, but is uh, a more general feature. Yeah, I, I, I'm really enjoying seeing features like this coming out. Um, I know um, it's, it's one of those things where some people just do this. My dad usually talks fairly loudly, but if I'm sitting in a car with him, I'm always there going, I need you to speak louder, dad. I can't hear you properly. Now, obviously I'm not going to be putting in my AirPods Pro to have a conversation with my dad in the car, but I can see this in, in other instances with other people who usually speak fairly quietly where it's a little difficult uh, to hear them, you know, being able to just pop in an AirPod Pro, though, of course, mine have finally developed that dreaded sound so I've sent them in uh, for a pair today, actually. So hopefully I'll get them back and then I can maybe get the beta at some point if it if it becomes publicly available rather than selectedly available. Um, but uh, yeah, this is going to be great. And I'm looking forward to this when iOS 15 launches at the latest. Yes. All right. Uh, this next one I was really pumped to hear because right now when someone asks me, hey, I want to make my, my garage door a smart garage door, and I wanted to work with HomeKit, I say, okay, you can either spend a boatload of money by getting the necessary components of the uh, MyQ system where you have the MyQ garage door opener and the HomeKit hub that they sell or a uh, one of their smart garage door uh, engines or motors, uh, the, the, the actual like whole mechanism. And either of those options are rather expensive or you do what I do, which is a complicated process of having the MyQ Smart Garage door opener connected via uh, HomeBridge. And for some people, that's just a lot to do. So Maros, who we've talked about on the show quite a bit, comes along and says, you know what? You don't need all of that. You mm -hmm. just get our Smart Garage door opener. And so they have made a HomeKit enabled uh, Smart Garage door opener that will work with most garage doors. Uh, yep. I love it. I think that's great. <laughs> yeah, I've actually got a friend in the Netherlands who recently got one of these installed and his only complaint was it's reliant on 2.4 gigahertz Wi-Fi. Um, now, it's not going to use 5 gigahertz Wi-Fi because obviously that's got a shorter range. Um, but, um, you know, it, it's using Wi-Fi rather than, say, Thread. Thread in your garage, probably not a great idea. Do you really want to stick an Apple TV or a HomePod Mini in your garage just for Thread? Um, on a garage door opener? No, not really. But it could use, say, Zigbee or Z-Wave or something like that and talk to a hub, um, which would, you know, reduce the amount of devices on your Wi-Fi network. Um, uh, but, you know, I've heard good things about these from multiple people. If I had a garage door, Micah, I would buy one of these just to test it out. Sadly, I do not have garage door. Uh, I park my car outside in the rain. Um, but you know what? It does fine. And uh, if I move and get a garage, then I will be getting one of these so I can report back on Smart Tech Today whether or not I like it myself. Uh, that would be fantastic. I would love to hear what you think about it because if it is great, I would probably replace my MyQ one with it because uh, as it's I always... Cheaper. Yeah, and as I've always noted on this show... The closer you can get to 
the kind of bare bones as possible, the less hoops you have to jump through in automation. Well, okay, Rosemary is kind of the exception to the rule because somehow she makes all this magic work. But the less hoops you have to jump through to make the automation work and the less servers you have to talk to and and uh, all these different integrations you have to jump through, the better the experience is typically going to be then I would like to, you know, go that route versus because sometimes the way that the MyQ API is set up, uh, if the Homebridge plugin ends up pinging the server, the API too many times, it mm -hmm. will lock, it'll lock you out of your account. And so then it can't update, it doesn't know, and it runs into all these issues. And then sometimes that causes issues then with my, uh, oh, I just thought of a problem. I wonder if I can have two, uh, one yes. that isn't connected to, that's my, that might be what I do because the good thing about my, um, my Q garage door opener is it works with Amazon's key service and I use that. That is how I get packages delivered is to my garage. So if I just disconnected uh, key from HomeBridge and HomeKit altogether and use the Meros as my option for controlling the garage door with HomeKit, that's probably what I'll end up doing. So I may buy one of these two and then we can both talk about it. <laughs> yeah, I, th I, th I think, I mean, I think you're going to be there before me, Micah, because I would have to literally move house and I've only been living here uh, 11 months, 11 months as of three days ago. I know because I started getting emails through about, hey, don't forget to renew your insurance and your internet deal is up. Would you like to switch? Yes, please. Um, and I've been sorting all of that out this week. So I'm going to stick here for another couple of years. But uh, if, if I find a friend who needs a garage door, Opener, then I will certainly be uh, recommending the Meryl so I can install it myself for them and see what it's like. Awesome. All right, let's uh, move on. <laughs> oh my gosh, that superhero. For folks who are listening, uh, this Meros ad has a uh, superhero wearing a cape and uh, sort of helping out in your smart home. So you could think of your smart home as a superhero. That's kind of cute. Uh, and then last but not least, uh, Rosemary, why don't you tell us about your next, uh, are you planning on getting one of these as well, the air purifiers or just the air sensors? So I'm planning on just getting an IKEA air sensor. I have recently invested in, I now have four air purifiers running around. I was not intending on getting four. There's a long story here. Um, but I, I bought the Smart Me one because that um, can, that has direct home kit support, uh, which I wanted. Um, and I love it. It's great, but it was way too big to put in my office and in my bedroom. So I then bought two smaller Hymox ones, which uh, use the Toya app, T-U-Y-A. And those have an official Homebridge plugin from Toya itself or uh, official Home Assistant support. So I'm using those in the office in the bedroom. And then I needed a Dyson fan in my living room or I needed a fan in my living room and I ended up getting another Dyson air purifier fan. So uh, yeah, I've got a lot of air purifiers running around, which means I don't need a coffee table that's also an air purifier. But wow, this is genius because what furniture or what equipment do you actually really want in the middle of your room? An air purifier. What do you not really want to stick in the middle of your room because you're going to trip over it all the time and it's going to be very inconvenient? An air purifier. What would you put in the middle of your room? A coffee table. Oh, look, it's got an air purifier built into it. Wonderful. Ikea, you're genius. I Love it. Uh, this has been rumored for a while now. I keep, I kept seeing it pop up on the uh, IKEA Trad Free subreddit. Um, people spotted that the air um, section appeared in the IKEA app, um, which um, you know, obviously that you know they have to add support sometime. Though IKEA usually add support a little bit later. But IKEA have had dumb air purifiers in store for a while now. Um, and they are very dumb in that once you turn them on, if you just turn them off at the plug and turn them back on, woo, they come back on. So they're great if you just want an on-off air purifier and they're pretty quiet as well. Um, and they, they're just square boxes. They look quite nice actually. Uh, but these ones are interesting. So it looks like um, the air purifier, you can buy it either as an air purifier or you can buy the legs to turn it into a table. Um, and it comes in white um, and uh, birch color or black. Um, and apparently some of these are actually um, visible in stores for people to go and view, but you can't buy them until October or so, which is a shame. Um, but IKEA recently launched um, some standalone air sensors. Um, and these are surprisingly cheap. I think they're about 10 pounds or so. Um, so they're probably 10 to $15. Um, and um, that 
is much cheaper than usual for um, this kind of sensor. So I am going to be getting one of these. I'm going to stick it in my bathroom. That is the only room. Actually, no, that's a lie. I could also get one and put it in the kitchen. Um, so I've got two rooms that have yet to get some kind of air sensor in them. Uh, I'm using Netatmos sensors in other rooms. They're quite popular here in Europe, but uh, obviously not so much in the US. But these are definitely interesting. I love the fact that IKEA stuff uses uh, Zigbee protocol rather than crowding onto your Wi-Fi um, and occupying more space. Zigbee, even though Matter exists, and or rather, um, well, it's uh, it's uh, Matter, it was Chip, um, and they have the Thread protocol. Thread is not going to be everything, I don't think. So Zigbee is still an excellent standard to go by. And uh, IKEA stuff being affordable and easy, that's my parents' gateway drug into home automation. They don't realize it yet, but they, they are on the slippery slope. I got them some smart plugs for Christmas and they liked them. And then they got a smart doorbell and now they're getting smart cameras. And it, it's all going, Micah. I, I've got a plan. Uh, I don't think they've realized it yet, but that they will succumb to the smart home. <laughs> it will only take time. Well, I think it's one of those things when you can actually show somebody a uh, genuine convenience provided by home automation, and that's not being able to talk to a voice assistant to make things happen. It's stuff happens for you, so you don't have to do it. I think that's when they go, huh, this is actually really interesting. Um, because, yeah, I bought them two smart um, plugs, and then they bought themselves um, three smart blinds from Ikea. Um, and so now they have three blinds that are automated and it's great. They go down automatically at sunset every day. My mom opens the bedroom blind in the morning with the button and it opens the other uh, blinds automatically as well. It's brilliant. Um, and they love it because it, it does just happen. And if nobody's at home, then they open automatically around about eight o'clock in the morning. Um, and uh, my parents think that that is a, a brilliant feature and they really love that. Uh, to be fair, I enabled them because I installed my blinds here and they saw them and went, oh, that's a good one. I'm going to get that. Hmm. Um, all right, that brings us to the end of the news segment, which means it is time to take a trip-ish through Rosemary's smart home because uh, Rosemary has dropped little tidbits here and there in our conversations about all the different ways that she makes use of smart technology and automations. And I've always been curious to hear about uh, her setup and hear kind of how she has things uh, running. And so I'm handing over the reins to you. You can either walk us through room by room. You can walk us through the experience of, I went, I walk into my front door and these lights turn, however you want to tell us about how your setup is done is up to you. Uh, but I think that the listeners would be very interested to hear what you've got going on uh, in All your right. smart home. Okay, Micah, I'm going to give you a challenge. You're going to have to stop me and ask questions every time you want a little bit more detail because I think in order for us not to be sitting here by the time iOS today starts tomorrow, I'm going to have to give a very high-level overview of what happens. Um, and I think what I'll just do is I'll go through a day in my life and the automations that happen around that. Um, so I'll start with my alarm going off. When my alarm goes off in the morning, um, if I hit the snooze button, um, then there is uh, a great app called Signals for HomeKit, which has shortcut actions. And there's a shortcut action on my phone. When I snooze any alarm, the lights in my bedroom on, on the sides of my bed flash really brightly. It's incredibly obnoxious. Um, so this is in order to force me to wake up. Um, <laughs> uh, and so that's the alarm on my phone. Um, and then approximately five minutes later, the the alarm on my stereo pair of HomePod minis goes off. Um, and it plays the same playlist every morning, but it plays it on shuffle. So it's not always in the same order. And I actually have just remembered now that there's a couple of tracks that I wanted to remove from that um, because they, they're annoying me. Um, and I want to replace them with something else. So I'm going to have to think about what I'm going to put in there because the playlist is designed to be about an hour um, because this helps me get through and by the time this is up, I should have been sitting at my desk for at least half an hour working. Um, so, so that happens. Um, and then the blind in my bedroom also goes up automatically and the light strip stuck to the underside of my bed turns on as well. This is to provide me with enough light to get up and move around without also blinding me with the overhead light. Um, because, you know, the last thing you want is your tech torturing you. You want your tech helping you. Um, but the blind going up, it, it's a little noisy. It's an Ikea blind. They're not super quiet. It's fine. Um, and, you know, it's going off when 
you know, five minutes after my first alarm's gone off. So it's it's there to really help me wake up. Um, and then, uh, yeah, and then I, I get up and get on with my day. Um, I walk into the kitchen. If it's dark, uh, the kitchen light will automatically turn on. I'm using an Aquara, um, or how how is it that you pronounce that name, Mikey? Uh, you told uh, me. Aquara. Acara. Acara, that was it. So it's A-Q-A-R-A. They have standalone light sensors. They're tiny little dots. Um, and I have one of those stuck to the window frame in every single room to tell me how bright uh, it is in the room, um, which allows me to do accurate determinations as to, hey, we should turn some lights on in here because it's dark and you can't see. Um so, um, yeah, so I walk into the kitchen to grab some breakfast. If it's dark, the light turns on um, and then it turns off again five minutes later. That's um, I've I got an electrician to replace the light switch in my kitchen there um, with a smart switch. Um, other than that, smart bulbs everywhere. Um, but yeah. Um, <laughs> oh, wait, so let's then, stop there. Smart bulbs. Yeah. Uh, what do you have mixed uh, mixed supply? Do you tend to go for one brand of smart bulb? Uh, how, how does the, you know, the luminance value of the bulb factor into it? Kind of what's, what's your decision on smart bulbs and do you like ones that have color, ones that don't have color? Tell us about that. So, uh, for a long time, well, for a long time and until I'd say last month when uh, I moved into this place, I just had few basic white bulbs. Um, and so they came on, they came off, they did brightness, but they didn't have the ambiance setting. Um, and I do have one color overhead bulb in the bedroom. Um, and that's because um, if I'm if I'm not feeling super well and I want a little bit of light, but I don't want to ruin my night vision, I turn that one onto red. I find overhead lights um, in color don't really work for me. Um, that's just because I end up not using them in color. So I'm just using hue white ambience bulbs in the vast majority of places. Um, my rooms are quite small, so I don't need to worry too much about um, how bright they can get. Um, so for example, in here, this is just um, one of the hue white ambience overhead bulbs. But as you can see, I've got some other hue lights behind me. I've got a Go um, over behind the juggling balls and I've got an Iris um, over behind the Lego. Um, and those can do color and add accent lighting wherever I need it. Um, I also have some of the lovely Nano Leaf light panels uh, hung up in my living room, which are both amazing decor, um, but they're also really bright if I want some fun color lighting at my living room rather than overhead bulbs. So I've got the original triangles and they also have a rhythm module. So I can plug them in or they can listen, or you can actually plug in an aux cable um, to have them listen to music. And my next project, I've not done it yet, but I've got an old airport express, Micah. I've got a long aux cable. I think you might see where this is going. I'm planning on setting the nano leaf light panels to be a um, an airplay destination for uh, music so that then I can play music to them, but have music play quietly and have them flash in time with the music. Because right now I need to turn up my home pods pretty loudly and I'm not sure my neighbors would appreciate that. Um, so uh, I'm planning on doing this via airplay instead. Um, but yeah, so I've got a variety of lighting options, um, which is great. Uh, the light strip that I mentioned, it's also on the bookcase behind me. I've got one on the bookcase here, one in the bedroom. They are the Meros light strips. They are uh, 30 feet long, um, which is insane. They come in two 15 meter strips. They're incredibly yeah. cheap. Watch out for deals on Amazon. They are amazing. I love them. My only complaint is their Wi-Fi rather than um, using anything else, uh, but they're cheap. So I'm, I'm not going to argue. And they're native HomeKit compatible as well as working with Amazon's ecosystem and Google's assistant, uh, if this and that, and smart things. Um, so uh, there's a HomeKit and a non-HomeKit version. I don't think the pricing varies massively. So if you if you want HomeKit support, just buy them with HomeKit support. Um, but anyway, after I've got breakfast, Micah, I go back to my room, get dressed, uh, and then I tell my HomePod um, that uh, I'm getting up um, or I've got up. I can't remember exactly what it is now. I say this automatically every single morning. Uh, and that's the point where it opens the curtains in my bedroom. It rotates the blinds in my living room. I have these vertical hanging blinds. Um, and so it just rotates them to be open so that I get natural light coming in. But before that, when I'm wandering around in my PJs, I don't want everyone to see me. So the curtains stay closed. They let a little bit of light through. Uh, not a lot, just enough that with the other lights, I can see everything. Um, and yeah, the, the vertical blinds then rotate. Um, and that is Soma stuff. Um, so I have... Um, Vertical, just regular up and down 
blackout blinds in my office um, and bedroom. From Ikea, I have the translucent one in the kitchen. And then in my living room, I already had these blinds where they open and close in the middle. And then there are lots of panels that can rotate in different directions. So I bought two of those uh, Soma um, Connect um, options, one which works on a chain, one which works um, on a rope. Um, unfortunately, I didn't have a tilt one for these, which is standard. So um, when I open the rotate, it actually just flips it all the way around, which is not amazing. So I have to say open it to 50%. Uh, so I've set up a scene for that. Um, but yeah, and so I love that. And then I walk into my office. I, I set usually these lights to try and match the color of whatever I'm wearing. It's become a bit of a running gag at my day job. Uh, and I get on with my life. Um, if I find it's a little bit dark in here and I want to add some lights, I have this button here on my desk. Um, if I press this button, it doesn't do a huge amount as far as you can see but it adds lighting down from the bookshelves behind my desk. Um, and this is, you know, one of the reasons why I like having everything um, in smart home stuff is because then at the end of the day, when I go to bed, there's a button by my bed. I rush, re reach out, press it once, and it goes around the house and it looks and it goes, okay, all the blinds are down. All the curtains are closed. Um, the rotate on the living room blinds is either closed or open. Doesn't matter. Um, and all the lights are off. The dehumidifier in the hallway is turned off um, and things like that um, because um, I have an indoor drying rack um, and I think people might like this. I've stuck a door sensor to it. So a door sensor can tell you if it's something is closed or open. So when uh -huh. I put it up, it's open. Okay, so I do a load of laundry. It comes out of the washing machine. I could put it in the dryer, but a lot of my things aren't dryer safe. So instead I put up this closed rack, which automatically sets that sensor to open and it turns on the dehumidifier in my hallway. Oh, um, that's so smart. That is so yeah. smart. Because this way, I don't need the dehumidifier running all the time. When I hit my podcasting button in here, it turns off my dehumidifier because I don't want that running while I'm talking to you. That's a noise that you might hear, especially in the summer where I do have to sit with this door open because otherwise I am going to melt in here. Um, but, um, you know, it, it automatically turns that on. And then when I close the dryer later because all the, the um, clothes are dry and I've taken them off and folded them, put them away, it turns off my dehumidifier. Um, and so I've got a couple of little things like that hiding around where I'm using things not quite in the way they were intended, but I think mm -hmm. that's pretty useful. Um, one big thing that I've done recently is smart door locks. I held off on this for a really long time. Um, and then I spotted that Yale have a multi-point lock. It's the Yale Connexus. Um, and so multi-point locks for people who aren't familiar, they're very popular over here in the UK in PVC doors. Um, and basically it's a vertical door handle with a, um, well, a vertical door lock with a handle coming out. And in order to engage the locking mechanism, you have to lift the handle. This moves several levers up in the door and then you can turn the key. You can't turn the key unless you've lifted the handle. Um, and Yale actually have a Connexus which does this, which is great. And they have a Z-Wave module that you can stick in there. And the reason why I held off on this for ages is because HomeKit locks with multi-point don't exist. As far as I can tell, they just aren't mm -hmm. out there. So frustrating when you've got one of those doors. And that's my primary door that I use most of the time. Um, so if I was going to smartify a door, that's the one I wanted to do. And then I found the Yale Connexus and that they have a Z-Wave module. And so I did a little bit of digging around. And I already knew about Home Assistant and I knew that you could get like a dongle that you plug into say a Raspberry Pi running Home Assistant and it could provide a Zigbee network. And then I found that you could do the same thing with a Z-Wave dongle and a Z-Wave network. And so my God, I went down the rabbit hole of Home Assistant and <laughs> oh wow, um, there, there's so much that you can do there. I am not using Home Assistant anywhere near to its capacity yet. This is something I really want to dive into on a lot more. Um, mm -hmm. But because of the Z-Way module that I put in the door and I set it up, uh, I put it in the handle, I set everything up, I connected it to Home Assistant. Home Assistant could then lock and unlock my door. Um, and just for anybody who's there going, oh my God, I would never want a smart lock. Um, you know, it's, it, you know, it's, it's somebody's just going to hack it. If somebody wants in your house, they're going to break a window. Like this isn't a glass door. 
they're not going to waste time trying to pick a door lock or hack a door, hack the door lock. They're just going to smash the window and come right in. Um, or they're going to try the door and go, it's locked, next one. Um, you know, it, it's it's not going to make a huge difference here. Um, so yeah, so either way, I've got the C-Wave module. It can be unlocked and locked via Home Assistant. That's only available on my local network. But then Home Assistant can add things to HomeKit for you. Um, so for people who've used Homebridge or heard of Homebridge before, Home Assistant can do a similar thing where it can take accessories which are set up in Home Assistant and make them available to you through HomeKit. So you scan a barcode, you add Home Assistant as a bridge, and then ta-da, my locks have shown up. Because of course I got one lock and it's like, oh wow, this is amazing. But, you know, just in case I lose, lose my keys, it'd be great if I could get in like via a number pad somewhere because there's four other, uh, or sorry, there's three other apartments in this building. So it's probably going to be somebody at home to let me in to the building or, you know, certain times of the day, I can just buzz myself in through the trade button. Um, though I have another way for that as well, which I'll get to in a moment. But uh, hmm. then I got uh, the Yale keyless lock, um, which just has a number pad on it. So worst case scenario, I can get in through there, type a number in on the number pad and voila, done, I'm in. Um, so I can get in and out pretty easily. Um, but of course, you know, when you get home, you don't want to have to, you know, open the blinds, turn on the lights and all that stuff by yourself. Um, so whenever I arrive home or somebody arrives home, it automatically, uh, if it's after dark, it turns on the lights um, in my uh, living room, which is a room that I would usually go into. Also the hallway um, so that I can, you know, see in the other rooms. Um, and it um, rotates my blinds to 50%, which makes them, um, you know, straight so that you could see straight through. And then it opens them. It also opens my living room curtains for me. Um, one thing that I've recently added though is just reaching out for it, a curtain over my door, door in the hallway. Um, and I've added a switch bot to this as well. So for people going, wait, how can you automate curtains? Uh, switch bot, it's a little robot that sits on a rail um, or in the rail, if you've got one of those eye rails. Um, and then it's a bot and it goes backwards and it goes forward. So you press the button and then it opens or closes your curtains. Um, and that was the wrong way around. So if I press the other one, then voila, the, I've specifically ah, chosen yeah. one for the curtain over there. Um, and it's just going and closing it. They are pretty great. They are a way of making your curtains smart without you actually needing to do any hardware work. Um, mm -hmm. Because a lot of smart curtain options out there involve buying specific rails and things like that. And then you go charge things and so on. And I mean, that is fine if you own your place. But at the same time, you know, do you really want to be spending $300 on a curtain rail? <laughs> Right. Yeah, that stuff gets so pricey. Uh, yeah, it's it kind of does. wild. <laughs> yeah, it it really does. It's so expensive. Um, whereas switch bolts are pretty cheap. The remote control is entirely optional. Uh, they recharge via USB-C or you can get a solar panel that plugs into the USB-C on them and it'll charge them as well. Um, it's great. And so, you know, if, when they're closed... Um, uh, and sometimes I, I close them a little early um, because I use those light sensors I was talking about. Um, if it appears to be dark um, and I walk into a room, then it will close the curtains, but it will not close the blinds. Um, and the reason for that is, is while it might be too dark for me to see, that is not too dark for the solar panels to charge. Um, so then the solar panels can be charging a little bit. Um, and theoretically, they should get some light where they are during the day as well. Um, I say theoretically because... You know, with all these things, there there's a little bit of an art to finding exactly the right positioning so that it will get light during the day, but it's also not annoying you by sitting on the curtain somewhere totally visible. Um, but yeah, there's there's a whole bunch of things going on, um, and I honestly don't really even think about it anymore because I've got this stuff set up, and my home just does the things that I want. Like this radiator here behind me is actually just plugged into the wall, except it's not plugged into the wall. It's plugged into a smart plug, an IKEA smart plug. And I've got a net atmos sensor up there, which tells me the temperature in the room. And I've now used Home Assistant to stick the two of them together as a thermostat. Um, and then I can say, set the office temperature to 20 degrees Celsius. Um, and it will do that. And then it turns on and off this radiator over here in, to achieve that temperature. And that's it. And that's all it does. And then when I leave, it automatically sets it to 14. I come home. I walk in here and it sets it back to 20. 
Um, there, there's a whole bunch of things you can do where you don't, you know, once everything is set up, it does just work. The, pro mm -hmm. the teething problems are really getting things set up and figuring out why does this annoy me? Because yeah. that is, of course, always the problem. Like, ah, this is so frustrating that I've got to pull out my phone to open the app to turn on my lights. Well, you shouldn't be doing that. You should be having sensors that say, hey, you know, Rose is sitting in this room um, and she, whenever she turns on um, Plex on her television into movie mode, she doesn't want the overhead light on. Um, but she's watching a film. So, okay, we're going to close the rotate on the blinds, check the light level. Okay, now we're going to close the curtains because it's not dark enough or it is dark enough so we won't close the curtains. Um, you know what and you've just done? You have inspired uh, an automation that I need to set up because this happens every night now that I think about it. And I don't know why I didn't do it before, which is that in my living room, when it gets dark, the we turn on the lights, the, the Philips Hue lights in the living room. And... Mm -hmm. While we're watching TV, I always end up turning off the table lamp because the glare uh, from the table lamp covers part of the screen and then I can't see that part of the screen very well. And yeah. I do that by hand every time we're watching television. I don't have to do Micah. that by hand. Micah, I know, Micah, right? Micah. I do a show called Smart oh. Tech Today and I didn't even think about fixing that with an automation. That's exactly what I'm going to do. Yeah. So what I have done there is um, because I don't really care about glare on the TV um, when I'm just, you know, scrolling through the Plex menu, for example, um, I have added Plex as an occupancy sensor to my HomeKit home through the <laughs> Plex HomeBridge plugin. Um, now, I will grant you this really only works if you primarily watch things through Plex. If you're using stuff like Netflix, it's it's not great. Um, the, you know, you're going to have to figure something else out for that. Maybe just do it whenever the TV turns on. Um, but I, I decided that because I watch most things through Plex, I would use the Plex occupancy sensor. Um, and so whenever that turns on, um, and I've set this up specifically so when it's only movies, because if I just watch an episode of something during the day, um, I don't really care. You know, like I'm watching Will and Grace over lunch or something. It's fine if there's some glare on the TV. You know, it's not great quality anyway. It's an old show that I ripped from DVD, but it's still fun. Um, uh, so, you know, a little bit of glare here and there is absolutely fine. Um, but yeah, this stuff is pretty cool when you get it set up. And it is just looking for those little annoyances in your life. Um, like one of the things that I realized, um, because I installed the smart blinds very early on, but I realized at the weekends I get up and I wander around the house, but I don't come into this room, my office, until about midday on a Saturday or later. Mm -hmm. Because I'm I'm not working and I'm doing a whole bunch of other things like catching up on laundry, lounging on my sofa or in a hammock outside. Um, and so I realized, actually, you know what? You know, these curtains are not being open. I then walk in, it's like, oh man, it's dark. And then the lights turn on because it's dark, right? No, instead, what it should do is go, hey, it's dark, but your curtains are closed. Open the curtains or the curtains should just be open in the first place. Um, right. And that that is, you know, that is the ideal that um, I'm achieving. And so it's like, actually, you know what? When I open the bedroom curtains, open these curtains as well. And when I go to bed, close the curtain across the front door. Um, when I go out, close the curtain across the front door. But when I get post through the front door in the morning, just to open that curtain for me, please, because I'm going to have to go there and check that nothing's got stuck in the letterbox anyway. Um, and so it, it, it does that. Um, what I really need to work on is parcel detection. Um, so that if there's a parcel on my front door mat um, and I'm at home, open the curtain. Um, theoretically, I should see it. I have a, an echo show down here. Um, so whenever there's motion outside, uh, I set up a little uh, automation there um, using, um, it's the A-L-E-X-A ac action where you can type what you would say to it. And so I put show the front door. Um, so then whenever it detects motion, um, it, it does the command that checks, uh, that should show me the front door. And then it, of course, immediately says, okay, I wish it didn't do that, but you can't change that. And then it shows me our front door, um, which is great because I've got a ring camera and you can do that with the Echo Show. Um, so that's primarily what it's there for. It's there going, here are your Amazon parcels arriving and here's your front door. Um, mm -hmm. uh, but yeah, I would love it if um, I could detect if there was a parcel there. Um, and then when I get home, open the curtain as an indication of, hey, you should open this door 
and check for parcels there because uh, I had that earlier today. I had to go water my parents' plants for them. I came back, there was a parcel. I forgot about it for quite a while. Um, and then I, and then my neighbor knocked on my door and said, hey, uh, here are your parcels. They, they, they appear to have been on your doormat all day. <laughs> Like, oopsie, I'm sorry. No, it's only been about, oh, wait, four hours. Darn it. <laughs> <laughs> but yes. Uh, so, um, wow. I can see, yeah, <laughs> keeps, I can there, see. There, somebody, there are a few questions. Yeah. 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 I can see Prof Panda, a bear uh, from New York City uh, in uh, the Discord, um, is asking how I achieve presence detection in a room. Um, I'm using motion sensors for this. Motion sensors are not perfect, but they're pretty good. Um, I'm not exclusively using motion sensors, however. I'm also using some Akar vibration sensors. So I have one stuck here to my office chair. I would remove it for you, but that, it's quite difficult for me to get to while I'm sitting. I actually can't reach it. Um, but they're just little square uh, sensors that you can stick. Um, and that vibrating uh, is motion. Um, and so um, that helps me detect whether or not I'm in my office because, of course, me just sitting here, uh, I've got a vibration sensor up there. I've got another one over there. Theoretically, those two should see me wherever I am in the room. But if I'm sitting here, sometimes, especially when I'm working uh, coding, I can be very still for a while. And it's just my hands that are moving over the keyboard. That's not going to register as motion. Um, but I do, you know, jiggle a little bit as I sit. Um and this, the, the vibration sensor then works. Um, I am currently using a very old plugin for Homebridge um, for occupancy, uh, where you can just say, hey, add these like three switches um, and that these all connect to this occupancy sensor. And then you can trigger um, each of the switches with a motion detector. It's very hacky. I'm working actually on writing a new Homebridge plugin uh, to replace this, which would be much better and allow you to do things like name the switches. So you don't have to remember that switch number one is the Hue motion sensor, switch number two is the IKEA motion sensor, and switch number three is the Akara vibration sensor stuck to your chair. I would actually like to name those um, so that I can, you know, see, um, you know, what things uh, are what, because certain sensors also stay on for a while after they've detected motion, even if they don't see motion. But it's primarily motion sensors there that I'm using with that. I'm also using, as I mentioned before, the Plex plugin um, for occupancy in the living room, because obviously when you're lounging there on the sofa, watching something, you know, your hand's going in now the popcorn bowl, but that's not really enough movement to trigger a motion sensor. Right, exactly. That's a, I mean, that's kind of uh, one of my issues, why I want to have the ultra wideband chips and different devices start to be able to be used for different things is because you get those funny vignettes in certain like workplace comedies where the person is doing this because the uh, office lights have all turned off because they didn't move. One does not like to have to remind the sensors that they are in a room. And so I'd love no. something, especially with my Apple Watch in particular, which stays on my wrist, having yeah. the ability so to I have use that seen as an occupancy one sensor. one amazing piece of technology that can do this. And that okay. is the Hiome, H-I-O-M-E. They're based in Chicago. Um, and they have little sensors that you can stick above a door and it can tell which way people go. It will detect large dogs as humans and very small children as animals. But other than that, it's pretty much perfect. Um, and it can see you walk into a room and it turns on an occupancy sensor for that room and walk out, which means that you need one to cover every single doorway in your home. Um, but say a doorway between your, your office and your hall, you won't need two sensors there. That's one sensor to cover that doorway. The problem with the high ohm, first of all, the price. Secondly, if you want to add batteries because you don't happen to have an outlet conveniently near every single door, that's more price. Thirdly, they're always out of stock. Fourthly, they don't ship outside the United States. Um, mm. uh, so, the, I mean, this is this is something there are I lots would of love. <laughs> if the folks at HIO want to get in touch with me and like, I don't know, sponsor Smart Tech Today or something and send them to me and you and, and Matthew, that would be amazing because I will totally review their stuff. But it's impossible to get hold of, but it looks great because this can detect room occupancy and it'll go, hey, they're in this room, um, which means that I won't have to do things like H use a dummy switch inside of Homebridge or from Homebridge. So a dummy switch is just a fake switch 
which turns on and turns off, but it doesn't actually turn anything physically on or off. And I use dummy switches for lots of things like, hey, someone is at home or no one is at home um, because these get turned on by the last person leaving home or someone arriving home, right? That That's how I do that. So then I can say, run this automation if someone is at home. Um, and I have one for oh, guests I as well. This. So that, yeah, I also have guests as well because my living room is where um, I have a sofa bed for, for guests when they come and stay or if they come and stay at some point when that's safe to do again. Um, and um, uh, but, you know, obviously if there's a guest staying there, I don't want to press the button by the side of my bed and plunge them into darkness um, as well. And for them to be going, wait, what, what happened? What do I do? I can't see anything now. I was in the middle of putting my pajamas on. What happened? Um, and so, you know, you know, if the guest button's on, it, it does different things. Um, but, um, you know, so I, when I press that button by the side of my bed at night to turn everything off, um, that turns on a dummy switch for a sleep. And so when the motion sensor in my bedroom detects motion, Usually it will turn on some lights depending on one light level or if it's very dark, it'll turn on all the lights, right? But guess when mm -hmm. it's darkest? In the middle of the night. Guess when your motion sensor will detect you? When you roll over in bed. What is the one thing you don't want when you roll over in bed at three o'clock in the morning because you got poked in the arm the other day and out your arm's sore, so you rolled and then you roll back. You don't want your lights turning on full brightness, do you? So there's two ways of fixing this. One, you've got a motion sensor, you put it somewhere where it can't see you at night and you put it back where it can see you in the morning. If you're me, you will absolutely 100% forget this and then you'll walk into your room at nine o'clock in the evening and boom, it's 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 dark and none of the lights come on, you get very confused. Or you can have a fake switch. So when the motion sensor detects motion and a sleep is off, then do the lights. But otherwise, just don't do anything. Um, which is brilliant for me because it means that when it detects motion, if I haven't told it I'm asleep, then it will, of course, uh, you know, turn on my lights for me, which is perfect. So I don't get woken up at three o'clock in the morning by really bright lights. This is also helped by the fact that the Hue and Ikea lights um, have um, the restore state functionality if they lose power. So if there were to be a blip of power in the middle of the night, um, then... Uh, you know, I'm, I'm not going to get woken up by really bright lights because I should have said before my bedside lights are actually uh, IKEA trad free lights um, just because I wanted colors in those because that's that's a fun area to do color. Colors are great for accent lights and, and you know, lights at lower levels, but overhead I find white is best. I agree a thousand percent on that. Um, all right. Folks, we, unless Rosemary has any other things she wants to mention smart home wise, we should move to our last segment of the show, which are our picks of the week. All right. Um, I'll kick off the picks since you say Rosemary can take a break, uh, take a second to breathe. And I'm just going to talk about something that I, Rosemary, you and I had talked about. Uh, it is officially available and officially in my hands. It is the Anchor Car Mount Charger, available for $36 on Amazon at different prices elsewhere, I'm sure. Um, and this is Anchor's own magnetic... Uh, mount for your car. I'm trying to pull it out of the package here. I was actually pleasantly surprised. So um, I believe it comes in white and black, but I got the white one because that was the one that was in stock or was going to be in stock soon. And I thought this was going to be like a plastic thing. No, it's got this aluminum back and it even has chamfered edges. So it's very Apple style. I was very impressed with that. Um, and it has one of those uh, standard ball joint uh, tightener fasteners on the back and then it comes with two different types of mounts there's one mount with 3m uh, that you can fasten to your dash and then you put the ball joint onto it and it has a little wire clip which is so nice to hold the wire um, and then your uh, mount can go on there and then it also has this really fancy because it has a stabilizer arm um, mount for your vent so it's got a vent clip in the back that you put into here let me show this from the side uh that you put into the the vent and then you pull back this little arm as you're putting it into the vent and then release and that will clamp it onto the vent and then this little stabilizer arm down at the bottom has these foam pads so that when it's clipped into the the vent 
it kind of can rest very easily uh, as it needs to. And then, of course, the ball joint is once again used to fasten the um, actual magnetic mount to it. Um, it does not come with a... Uh, a device for actually doing the power. So in the uh, box, you also get a cord, a USB-C cord, but you do not get an adapter. So if you don't have a USB-C adapter for your car, that is something you will need to get. But it comes with a very nice long USB-C cord. And yes, that means that on the back of the uh, actual magnetic mount itself is a USB-C port. I plug that in. And suddenly I've got uh, charging power. It's also got an indicator light at the bottom so you can easily see. And then uh, I'll just show you me magneting the uh, phone onto the uh, mount. And by the way, this is a, uh, you know, this is a full size hefty iPhone and it's on there. So if your car doesn't have superb, um, What's that called? Why can't I think of the term? The superb stuff that keeps your uh, suspension. If it doesn't have superb suspension, that's okay because this is doesn't seem to be uh, flying anywhere. Uh, so I was very impressed with this uh, magnetic mount. Uh, it's called the Power Wave Magnetic Charging Car Mount from uh, Anchor. And that, folks, is my pick of the week. I'm looking forward to installing this in my vehicle. And I'll probably end up getting one for my partner as well um, to replace the one that he has now. Uh, Rosemary Orchard, tell us about your picks of the week. Well, I didn't quite get the memo that it's one pick, Micah. So I kind of <laughs> have two things right here. Um, but to be fair, full credit to me, they go together. Um, they so this is Anchor's Nano 2. I didn't realize that we both picked Anchor products this week, but I guess we did. So hey, this is the Nano 2. I know. Um, and the Nano 2 comes in a couple of different options. It comes in a 30 watt, a 45 watt, and this one, a 65 watt. If you're looking at it thinking, that's kind of tiny. I did check earlier. It's the same size as the original 10 or 12 watt iPad Pro charger. This thing is teeny tiny um, because, and it's super cute and 65 watts, 65 watts right here. That will charge my MacBook Pro, but not without an appropriate cable. Now these are currently sold out on the Anchor website, but they were in stock a couple of days ago on Amazon. So keep an eye out there. Um, I believe this one is $40, uh, 45 watts is 35 and 30 watts is $30. Um, so these are the Nano 2s, which are a little bit chunkier and they come in this black and, and space gray um, rather than the the standard Nano, which will charge an iPhone at 20 watts and that's, that's white. Um, but if you need a cable to go with it, uh, Anchor have these flow cables and I got mine in a lovely lavender gray. So it also pretty. comes in a sort of salmon color, um, a turquoise color. I've got one in turquoise as well on my sofa actually. Um, but I really love this. These are incredibly strong cables. Like they have pictures of people like pulling things apart um, or, you know, lifting heavy weights or towing a car with these cables. Now, I wouldn't personally try and tow a car with this cable, but the beauty of this cable is it can do 100 watt power transfer, okay? So this is clearly more than the Nano 2 can do um, because the Nano 2 currently tops out at 65 watts. But this means I'm trying currently to future-proof all of my cables, Micah. Whenever I buy new USB-C cables, Amen. I'm trying to future-proof them. So yes. whenever I buy them, it's it's if it's USB-A, I don't really care that much. But when I'm buying these USB-C, I want 100 watts. Even though my MacBook is 13 inches and so on, it's just nice to know that whatever I use this cable for in the future, it's going to be able to handle the power. Um, now, I know that obviously, you know, Thunderbolt 3, Thunderbolt 4, um, all of that stuff, you know, that that's... That's another spec that I need to figure out at some point. Um, some of you smart-eyed people who are watching may have noticed mine does not have folding prongs. That's because here in the UK, we like to make these plugs as painful as possible should you step mm. on them. Um, <laughs> there's only one thing more painful than stepping on a UK plug, and that's stepping on a UK plug made out of Lego, Micah. Um, <laughs> and, <laughs> but, that uh, is people, actually, that's banned in the Geneva Convention. You are not allowed to make UK plugs out of Lego because that oh, is just Well, there we go. It's warfare. probably a good thing. If anybody's wondering why we have this particular pin set up, uh, I can highly recommend Tom Scott has a great video on YouTube about the UK plug, which is incredibly interesting. And he's a, a wonderful YouTuber, uh, very informative. Um, but yeah, so these are great. I just got this uh, yesterday. I've, I've tried it out with my MacBook Pro. 
zero problems. This thing is tiny. This is going in my MacBook Pro case. Whenever I take my MacBook Pro anywhere, I'm going to be using this. Um, and I love it. I wish it had folding prongs, but folding prongs are not very common over here in the UK because we have this three prong setup. Um, they're, they're pretty much in the, the iPad Pro charger and that taps out at 20 watts, which I can plug a MacBook Pro into. But if I'm using it and expecting it to charge at the same time, that's just not going to happen. So, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm pretty happy that this is available. And these are great. They're available in Europe, the UK, the US. Uh, go get them, people. Um, and uh, if they're out of stock, then, of course, don't forget, Camel, Camel, Camel can come to the rescue and let you know when they're back in stock and when they go on sale. Absolutely. Camel, Camel, Camel. If you don't have that yet. You've heard Rosemary mention it twice in different shows now. You've got to get it. I use it all the time. Um, in fact, I had to remove some ones that I had forgotten to because I'd already purchased the thing that I needed and I still had those alerts set up. So I had to go through yep. recently and clear the cruft out of my camel. Um, yes. Just as a note, I said before that the 65 watt charger was uh, uh, $40 is $45. Sorry about that. I, I got my currency conversion wrong. So $45 for the 65 watt, $40 for the 30, uh, for the 45 and, and uh, 40, uh, and probably uh, uh, what, $33 or $34 for the uh, 30 watt. So uh, there's plenty of options there. And the fact that this will uh, charge a MacBook Pro um, I mean, even if you plug this into one of the 16-inch Mapper Pros, it's it's not going to be brilliant, but it's going to get it there when it needs to. So yep. I would highly recommend it. Agreed. All right, folks, uh, as we had noted, noted last time, uh, if you have questions for Matthew and myself, or, and now Rosemary as well, uh, send those questions into stt at twit.tv. Uh, we record new episodes of the show every Thursday at 4.30 p.m. Eastern, 1.30 p.m. Pacific, 20, 20.30 UTC. Uh, and you can go to twit.tv slash live to watch us live or subscribe to the show. Just head to twit.tv slash stt and, and click on subscribe to audio or subscribe to video and pick the provider of your choice. That's how you can get the uh, show in whatever format and place you want it. Uh, I should mention, we've got this great thing called Club Twit. Uh, if you'd like to get all of our shows ad-free, you should check out Club Twit. Twit. It is a great service that gets you every single Twitch show, iOS Today, Smart Tech Today, Hands on iOS, all of it, uh, uh, without uh, listening to the ads. And then, of course, the Twit Plus bonus feed that has content you won't find anywhere else, as well as access to the members-only Discord server, which is a place to chat with hosts and producers and other Twit folks, as well as outside hosts and other uh, Club Twit members. So that all sounds great, right? Uh, how much does it cost? Seven bucks a month. With seven bucks a month, you will get all of those things. You just head to twit.tv slash club twit to check it out. And of course, our thanks for your support. If you do choose to head there, twit.tv slash club twit. Thank you. Rosemary Orchard, if folks want to follow you online, check out all your great work, where do they go to do so? Well, one of the places you can find me right here on Twit iOS today, if you don't watch it or listen to it, feel free to join us. Um, other than that, head to rosemaryorchard.com where you can find links to all three podcasts I do, books I've written, and other places you can find me on the internet, including micro.blog and Twitter with the username Rosemary Orchard. Micah, what about you? Well, you just head to chihuahua.coffee, C-H-I-H-U-A-H-U-A.coffee, where I've got links to the places I'm most active or... If you want to, you can just try a search for at Micah Sargent and uh, you will maybe come up with something. All righty. As we always do, it is time to say, well, it's good afternoon to the smart assistants here. It is good very late at night for your smart assistants, right, Rosemary? It's only 11 p.m., Mike, or it's fine. <laughs> oh, oh, dear. Oh, dear. Well, we thank you for joining us this week. We appreciate it. And thanks for giving us the tour of your smart home. Until next well, time. I'm sure there'll be plenty of questions. And so if, if you or a Matthew need to take a break again, then you can always ask me back and I can answer some of those. Beautiful, beautiful. Well, until then and until next week, we will say goodbye, everybody. Thanks for watching Smart Tech Today. Hey, what's going on, everybody? I am Ant Pruitt, and I want to tell you about my show, Hands on Photography, here on Twit TV. Each and every week, Thursday, that is. I'd like to sit down and share with you the best tips and tricks that are going to help make you a better photographer. And it's not always about Photoshop. It's not always about just having the biggest and baddest and bestest camera. It can be the simplest of things like 
Leave your eye open when you're looking through the viewfinder. All of these simple tips can really help step your photography game up. So subscribe to the show today. That's twit.tv slash hop. And I look forward to talking to you soon. You get those funny vignettes in certain like workplace comedies where the person is doing this because the uh, office lights have all turned off because they didn't move enough in the yeah. last. Oh, dear God. Folks, never do what I just did when you have a fountain pen in your hands because now there are blots of ink <laughs> on my wall and presumably all over my desk as well because Whoops. I had to do my shakety shake like a fool. I hope that's not Bay State Blue Ink there, Micah. That is a pain to get out. Uh, no, this is uh, a, uh, is it Lamy? Uh, L-A-M-Y? Lamy. Okay, their stuff's Lamy usually washable ink. because it's, uh, it, it's for schools and school kids. At least that was uh, their original target market. So I think you should be good there. Yeah. The fountain, I'm, yeah. The yeah. Oh my God. Yeah, exactly, Kevin. Normally I love your puns, but not right now. I'm just kidding. It's great. Um, <laughs> The one yes. thing that's good is that uh, this whole townhome is painted with semi-gloss paint, so it's not likely to stay on there. Anyway, so that was fun. <laughs> we will cap the ink pen, the fountain pen, before we ever yes, do that please. again.